Welcome to worship this Christmas Eve. We trust that God will bless you in this service of lessons and carols. The theme of our service is God's greatest gift. And as we progress through the various scripture readings and the carols that have been matched to them, we see God more and more lay out for us the true meaning of the gift that he has given to us at Christmas. Imagine yourself as someone who across the centuries was trying to figure out what does God's gift to us really mean? Or if you are unfamiliar with the content of these lessons and carols, well then let the meaning become clearer and clearer to you as we hear God's word and sing about his message in song. We thank you for taking the time tonight to be a part of our Christmas celebration.
Beloved in Christ, in this Christmas season, it is our privilege to hear again the message of the angels in heart and mind. We go to Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. We find here the Christ child lying in the manger. This evening, we will read and learn in Holy Scripture the story of God's loving purpose for us from the first day after our fall until the birth and glorious redemption brought to us by this holy child. Tonight, we hear how peace was lost and how peace is restored. But first, let us pray and ask for God's blessing on us and on our world as we prepare to worship him. Heavenly Father, we pray for ourselves and all people who worship you and your Son this holy night. By your holy word, lead us to say with the angels, glory to God in the highest. We pray for your blessing upon the people of our city, our state, our nation, and our world. We pray for the poor and the helpless, the cold and the hungry, the sick and sad, that you would give them the joy of your salvation and the comfort of your presence. We pray for unbelievers and enemies of the church, that through your law and gospel you would lead them to recognize your Son as their only hope for eternal life. Finally, we remember before you all who rejoice with us in heaven, who live in its greater light and beauty, that multitude no one can number, who died in faith, and now praise you in your heavenly temple. You have united us with them and with one another. We humbly offer up these prayers and praises in the words that Christ himself taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our first lesson this Christmas Eve is from the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, chapter 3. We begin reading at verse 8. You know very well that some Christmas gifts are not very practical. They, they really aren't ones that are needed. Then there are those gifts that are in every way practical but they are not much appreciated. In fact, some may find them offensive. The gift we're learning about this evening was not only practical, it was an absolutely necessary gift. You see, the first people God had created, Adam and Eve, had thrown away their relationship with their loving and perfect Father in heaven. They had done the very thing he commanded them not to do. They had eaten from the fruit of the tree in the garden that they were forbidden to consume. They had not trusted their master and maker. They thought they knew better than he. They wanted to do their own thing rather than his thing. This rebellion tore apart the fabric of their relationship with him, first of all, and then with each other as well. And because they were now infected with sin, they would never be able to repair the tear that they had created. But God could, and he promised to do so. He would send someone who would restore a right relationship with God once again. Our first lesson begins with Adam and Eve hiding from God in the garden in the cool of the evening, frightened, afraid, of what was coming from him and they had every right to fear but in this first lesson you will hear God promise them good news he is going to send someone who is going to crush the serpent the devil's head and save God's people it was the very first promise of his greatest gift ever 
Listen again as we now read Genesis chapter 3, beginning at verse 8. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the, the woman that you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers he will crush your head and you will strike his heel this is the word of the Lord Some gifts make our lives easier, like a robotic vacuum. Some make it easier to communicate, like a cell phone, and some are just fun to have, like an Xbox. What would be the greatest gift ever? The prophet Isaiah describes this gift for us more than 700 years before God first sent that gift to us here on earth, before the gift was opened. He said that that gift would be a person full of wisdom and understanding. He would be a person who was perfectly just and fair. He would be righteous, meaning that he would live a life that was exactly in line with God's own will. And he would one day bring about the restoration of that perfect relationship between God and man that had been lost and then would be restored as a part of the peaceful world the Lord had intended for his people from the very beginning. We hear these words of the prophet Isaiah in chapter 11, beginning at verse 1. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, 
the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness. He will judge the needy. And with justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness, the sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf, and the lion, and the yearling together. And a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together. And the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den. The young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This is the word of the Lord. Some people like to find creative ways in order to give their gifts. One family of whom I have heard has a a very inventive way of delivering birthday presents to their children. They set up a scavenger hunt of sorts. The children have to figure out clues in order to find out where the gifts have been hidden. And as they find each gift, there are clues that lead them to the next gift. It can be a great deal of fun. Our Lord did not want us to be wandering around aimlessly searching for the gift that he provided to us. He he did not want us to miss it. So throughout the Old Testament, in the words of his prophets, he gave us the clues. uh, he, He gave us the ability to determine when and where his gift was going to appear. In the next lesson, the prophet Micah predicted the exact location in which the Savior was going to be born, a small village just south of Jerusalem named Bethlehem. This is just one of more than 300 very specific prophecies that God gave to his people in order to make it possible for them to identify their Savior when he came. He makes him for us unmistakable. We know Jesus is the fulfillment of all these prophecies because he is the only one who has fulfilled every one of them. Listen to what Micah now tells us about this gift. And here are these two promises in particular. He says that the Savior's origins were from ancient times. In other words, he existed even before the world itself existed. And he says that in his greatness, his kingdom was going to reach to the ends of the earth. And it certainly has, hasn't it? In fact, we are celebrating his greatness here tonight on the other side of the world from where he was born. Listen to the words of the prophet Micah, chapter 5, beginning at verse 2. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, 
Though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be our peace. Some gifts are more difficult than others to give. Some of you are old enough to remember the Cabbage Patch doll. Those dolls were so popular that they were nearly impossible to buy. They were all sold out. If you really wanted to give one to your child, you had to pay hundreds and hundreds of dollars in order to get some, one from someone who had been fortunate enough to locate one. The gift that we are learning about tonight was not just difficult to give. It was impossible. You see, in order for God to rescue us from our sins, he needed to become one of us. He needed to enter our world and take our place. He needed to be our substitute. But to do that, he had to be born in an impossible way. He had to come as God and man in one person. So God sent one of his angels to tell a young virgin named Mary that he was, she was going to become pregnant in a miraculous way, by God's power. We read about this miraculous conception, this remarkable announcement of the angel to Mary in our next lesson from Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, beginning at verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? 
The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you. And the power of the Most High is going to overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. This is the word of the Lord. So, God had now revealed precisely where the gift would be born and precisely through whom the gift would come, the one who would give him birth. 
But God was not done sharing information about this gift. Once again, he sent an angel with a message, this time to Mary's fiancé, Joseph. Along with explaining how it was possible that his fiancé became pregnant, the angel gave Joseph two names that were going to be associated with the child. The first is the name Jesus a name which means Savior or Deliverer because Jesus would deliver his people from their sins. The second would be the name Emmanuel because Jesus was God in the flesh who came to live with us. And Emmanuel means God with us. God in human flesh. Listen to the words of the angel to Joseph as Matthew records them in chapter 1 of his book, beginning at verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and did yet not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said to the prophet, The virgin will, be, will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When jo- Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and he took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate the marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. This is the word of the Lord.
the time had finally come. After waiting for thousands of years, humanity was about to receive the gift of a savior, the greatest gift God had ever given his people. So where would the unveiling take place? On a stage? In front of thousands of people being broadcast around the world? No. Instead, God's greatest gift appeared in a lowly stable, in a tiny town, to an unremarkable couple. Let's listen to this remarkable gift given in Luke's Gospel. Chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. This is the word of the Lord. Grace and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of God for our consideration this Christmas Eve are the words of the Christmas gospel that we had read to us just a moment ago. Words from Luke chapter 2 beginning at verse 1. The account of Jesus' birth in Bethlehem. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, how did God enter your life? To answer that question for myself, I can tell you that on February 20th, 1965, I was baptized in my grandparents' living room with just a few family members gathered around. There, God claimed me as his very own. There, God promised me that everything that Jesus has done for the entire world, that counts for me as well. There, God entered my world. The Holy Spirit got his crack at my sinful heart and I became his own. For some of you it may have been when a friend or other acquaintance who cared about your soul took you by the hand and led you to find Jesus in his word. Maybe they took you to church. Maybe they shared the gospel with you themselves. But as their words or the words that you heard assured you that Jesus really does love you, that he really did die just for you, that he has taken your sins away and given you heaven, God entered your life. Sometimes people may wonder whether God really does enter our lives and whether he really is a part of our world. Even for Christians who have known him personally for a large part of their lives, sometimes it seems as though he is so far away, so quiet, so invisible, so far from helping us, so hard to find, that if he exists at all, well, he doesn't seem like he's really involved in my life. If you've ever felt like that, I know how you feel. And I want to assure you this evening that in spite of that, he is a part of your life. And if you've ever felt like that, then this evening's Christmas message is just the medicine that we need. You see, long before he entered our lives by faith, he entered our world in the events that we have just heard from Luke chapter 2. In the birth of Jesus Christ, we see how God enters your world. And when God enters your world, he does so in real time, in a real family, and as a real child. Now, we might be tempted to skip right past the opening words of Luke chapter 2 and not 
give them any serious attention, but they are important for us because they assure us that God entered our world in real time as a part of real human history. We know the words well. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. Luke's introduction does more than just introduce the story. This does do the, more than just give us a setting or a background. It's, it, it's, it's more than just some trivial information. It, it tells us that these events took place as a part of real, identifiable human history. Caesar Augustus and, and Quirinius were real men. This Roman census was a, an event from genuine human history. It was a historical occurrence. And that means that the birth that Luke describes is a historical event as well. Let's not lose sight of that fact. The Christmas story certainly can't be accused of lacking a certain entertainment value. We're, we're all familiar with it. The journey to Bethlehem, the, the failure to be able to find room in the inn, the poor couple desperately searching for some place to stay, stay because the woman is in labor. She's about to give birth for the first time. It's all under strange and unusual and untimely circumstances. The appearance of the angels, the, the coming of the shepherds. God did all these things in a way that's filled with human interest and emotion and drama. But more than just a good story, this is a real story. Do you see why that's important? The faith that we follow is more than a set of religious principles. It, 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 it can't be reduced to uh, merely uh, moral ideas or teachings that we are supposed to follow. Th these are, are not uh, simply religious myths. But here, God is entering your world. He's becoming a genuine part of it. Here, God is taking action to save us, to save you, to save me. By becoming involved in our lives, God presented these truths for more than our study, but for our faith and for our comfort. It's, it's not a mere matter of our entertainment. He, he wants us to be certain because he did all of these things in real time. And, and the way in which he brought it all about, it's astounding. Sometimes when we, we look at the humility of Jesus' birth and the, the very humanness of it all, it, it seems as if God... We're kind of sneaking into our world, sort of slipping in through a back door somewhere. How often haven't we heard the contrast made between uh, the way in which a, a royal birth might generally take place or the way that royalty might generally uh, live and the poverty and anonymity with which Jesus quietly appeared? But when we see the whole picture... And remember the real-life events God caused in order to have Jesus born when and where he wanted. It's really quite impressive. God made the most powerful world ruler issue a decree, a, a, a census, just so that this occasion could happen in the right way. Practically the entire nation of Israel had to move so that Jesus would be born in the right place at the right time. How God must care for you to go to all of that trouble. When was the last time anyone else among the world's leaders or the powerful was actually involved in helping you? When was the last time that anyone else changed the lives of an entire nation just to benefit you, to get you out of trouble? When God enters your world, he gets his fingers all into all of it. And, and there's nothing that is... Too much for him to change if it would help you. What a precious truth to know that God enters your world in real time. But the Lord wants us to be assured that he is closer to us still. 
He doesn't just involve himself in the genuine events of human history. When God enters your world, he does so in a real human family. Luke's familiar words continue. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. Genealogies in the Bible are rarely the most interesting part to read. You may have studied the long section of lists of people in the book of First Chronicles or maybe in Genesis chapters uh, 4 and 5, and you wondered how you were able or going to be able to keep your attention and get through it patiently. Verse after verse of lists of unfamiliar names of unknown people to you. That does not seem like very stimulating reading. Today, you and I can find the genealogies exciting. Both Joseph and Mary belonged to the house of David. They were both branches on the same family tree. Through Luke here and also Matthew, the and the Old Testament writers, we are able to trace Jesus' lineage back, right back to King David or right back to Abraham, all the way even to Adam, whom we read about in our first lesson tonight. Through his mother by blood and by adoption through Joseph, as it were, Jesus was born into a real human family with a real human family tree, and is a natural part of the family of all mankind. But why is that exciting? There's a, a story in my family, a, a legend of sorts, that if you trace the family tree back to my mother's great-grandpa, Holloway, the family has connections to British nobility. Now, I don't know if anybody has actually gone and researched the claim, but when I was growing up, it always seemed as something of a uh, privilege to think that we might have some connection with uh, blue blood, that we might have nobility or e even some connection to royalty in the family, even if that relationship was a, a very distant one. One thing I know for sure is that we all have a touch of the same blood that flowed through Jesus' veins, flowing through our own. That is a privilege that every one of us, every single one of us, enjoys. He was born into a, a real human family, and his family tree and our family tree must meet somewhere in the past. God must dearly love you and me to choose to become a part of our human family tree in this way. Our sins, you know, ruined the family name. All of us have, in some sense or another, been black sheep in this family. But despite how disreputable the family of mankind has become because of our sins, Jesus loved us so much that he condescended to join us in this family anyway. In fact, it is just because of those sins that he entered the world as one of you, as one of me, in a real family. He's qualified to be our Savior, because he entered your world as your brother in the faith. After saying that in Jesus, God has entered our world in a real family, perhaps the, the next point seems painfully obvious, but it is also one of the greatest wonders we have to consider from the Christmas story. God entered your world as a real baby, a real child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Now, if you had a choice, I doubt whether you would choose to live in a world with runaway crime. You would not choose to live in a world where, where tornadoes or floods could suddenly come and take away everything you own in an instant. You would not choose to live in a world that, that has tears and, and, and pain and, and insult and hatred as a part of it. But Jesus did. And he lived here without any special advantages, despite the fact sometimes people think he, he had some. He, he was equipped to feel it and experience it all the same way that we do when he came as a real child and grew up to become a real man. 
Luke tells us simply that when he was born, he had to be ripped in, wrapped in strips of cloth, just like all the other babies of his day. If, if it were in our day, it would have been, I suppose, pampers or huggies or uh, something like that. We see no special privileges given to him. When, when, when Mary's arms eventually grew tired from, from holding the little baby, well, then they had to put him down in the, the best kind of bed they could put together that they could find in a makeshift way there in the stable. And it happened to be a feeding trough for animals, uh, the manger full of hay for the cows or goats or sheep that took shelter in that same place. As Jesus grew up, the pains and the inconveniences of living in a world corrupted by sin did not change for him. We might imagine that when he was a little boy, if he fell and, and he scraped his knees, it would have hurt just like it would have hurt you when you were a child or as it would hurt one of your children. He, he may have gone and run to his mother for some comfort and might have cried. She may have put a bandage on it and then given him a hug to make it feel all better. We know that when he was a man, he got tired and thirsty after a long day of traveling. He, he cried when his dear friend Lazarus passed away. It hurt him too. As a real child, and then later as a real man, God experienced life in our world as we do. And he experienced human lovelessness and coldness and hostility as we do as well. There was no room for him in the inn, the guest house, when the family came to Bethlehem. No one cared enough to give their place to a poor pregnant woman who was in labor and about to give birth. No one cared about the health of a poor little baby. The coldness and lovelessness that he experienced there was just a foretaste of things to come. On a hill, about five miles away from Bethlehem, about the distance from here to Lake Thunderbird, or about halfway between here and Lake Thunderbird, there was another hill, a place where they crucified the criminals in Jerusalem. When God entered your world, he experienced human sin and hostility there too. But it wasn't just the, the coldness and the hatred of the people who lived there. We first entered Jesus' life and became a part of his world when he took all of our sins upon his shoulders and then he died our very real death and experienced the real pain for every human being so that our sins could be forgiven. That's not a truth intended so much to make us pity him as it is to make us see how dearly he must love us to enter our world as a real child, a real person like this. And since he has risen from the dead, he still becomes a part of our world today and still enters our hearts by faith. God may seem so distant when life is full of stress, and perhaps that may even be magnified by all the busyness of this holiday season, by all the weirdness of the, wor of the world and the year in which we have just lived. It can tempt us to ask, where's God been? Can we really think that he knows something about our lives? But today, tonight, you can be sure that he is here for you because you can be sure that he was there for you when God entered your world. Amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.
when you open a really exciting gift, something that you always hoped to have but never thought you really would, you can hardly contain your enthusiasm. That's how it is with such desperately desired gifts. It should surprise us, it should not surprise us then, that when God finally gave the gift of his son, even the angels were not able to contain themselves but sang for joy to the shepherds outside of Bethlehem. And it should not surprise us that the shepherds who had gone to see about what they had heard from the angels were not able to contain themselves but spread the news abroad to everyone they could tell about the good news the angels had shared. And the child in the manger that they had witnessed. Like the angels, we are here tonight to sing for joy over God's greatest gift. May we, like the shepherds, eagerly and joyfully tell others about it. We read from Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. This is the word of the Lord.
We stand to pray. O oh God, you make us glad with the yearly remembrance of the birth of your only Son, Jesus Christ. Grant that as we joyfully receive him as our Redeemer, so we may also behold him with sure confidence when he shall come to be our judge, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. May he who by his uh, incarnation gathered things earthly and heavenly into one fill us with such joy that comes from the knowledge of the forgiveness of sins and the hope of eternal life. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. We close with the hymn Silent Night. Say